Hong has become the most popular and the most lucrative job on Wall Street. It also has become a dream job for most of the students from STEM background. But I feel like most people still don't really understand what quants actually do on a daily basis. Especially there are really different types of quant in both sell side and buy side. Look at him. That's my quant. Your what? My quantitative. My math specialist. Look at him. You notice anything different about him? Look at his face. That's pretty racist. Look at his eyes. I'll give you a hint. His name's Yang. He won a national math competition in China. He doesn't even speak English. I might make another video to dive deeper into this topic and share some of my experiences as a quant researcher in hedge funds. But easy speaking, what quants do every day is to use math, statistics, and algorithm to solve some of the most complicated problems in the financial world. But today the topic will mainly focus on what a typical interview looks like for a quant because it doesn't look like a normal behavior interview people will have. Like for quant, 90% of the interview is mostly technical or scale oriented. So in the rest of the video, I will make a mock interview by two of me, try to cover some basic math and statistics and one round of code interview. I hope this can help people understand what a basic format looks like and what you should and you should not do during this type of interview. So let's get started. Today, we are going to walk you through some math problems and there's going to be one round of coding tests to evaluate your problem solving skills. So we're going to need you to prepare a pen and a piece of paper. Yeah, sure. Great, let's just start with a warm up question. So assume there are n random variables and any two of them have the same pairwise correlation. What is the range of the correlation should be? Interviewers really care about how candidates think and how they break down problems. And also they need to know whether candidates are able to explain their ideas clearly. So before jumping into any calculation, you should always briefly go through your logic first to the interviewer and try to be interactive during the calculation process. The response should look like. There are two really important properties to help me solve this problem. The first property is like for any correlation matrix, the diagonal elements should always be one and the matrix should always be symmetric. And the second property is positive semi-definite to ensure there is no linear combination of any variable having negative variance. So with these two properties, I can just solve the equation of the determinant matrix and eventually find the lower bound and the upper bound for the correlation. Let's say I have a n by n correlation matrix A with all diagonal elements one and the rest of the elements as row. The determinant of this matrix, let's just call it M, should be greater and equal to zero according to the positive semi-definite property. So the first thing which is pretty obvious is if rho equals to one, the determinant matrix will be zero. So definitely the upper bound for rho is one. And what I'm going to do is to transform the matrix to a triangular form so that I can take the products of all the elements on the diagonal and calculate its determinant. So I will try to use the last row to eliminate other rows first to make most of the non-diagonal elements zero. And then use this rows times negative row over one minus row to do another elimination to the last row. And finally, I got a triangular matrix where I can multiply all diagonal elements to get the determinant. And the lower bound should be So the range of correlation rows should range from negative one over n minus one to one. Sounds good. Let's just go to the next question. Assume there are two random variables, x and y. Both are i, d, follow standard uniform distribution. What is the beta of the regression given a condition of x plus y greater than one? To solve this problem, um, beta for a regression is simply just a covariance of x and y divided by variance x. So what I'm going to do is to find a joint probability density functions 
given the conditions and calculate all the expected values by integrals and eventually we can get the beta of the regression. So first, since x and y is iid and both follow uniform distribution 0 to 1 from a two-dimensional perspective, their probability density is just a uni square with area equals to 1. Now with the condition of x plus y greater than 1, we can basically just restrict the joint distribution to the region of the upper right triangle of the unit square. So the conditional density is 2 for x plus y greater than 1. And with these functions, I can easily get expected values So since x and y are symmetric, I don't have to recalculate anything about y variable. I just need to put everything into the covariance and variance, and we can get covariance as beta is just covariance over variance. So the answer should be negative one over two. It's quite comprehensive. But taking all these integrals take time and sometimes it's easier to make mistakes. Since you have already mentioned a unit square on a two-dimensional space, is there any way that can help you solve this problem in an easier way? Having a follow-up from an interviewer is quite often, and sometimes it is more difficult than the original question. So if you really have no clue of how to solve the problem, don't just say you have no idea or you don't know. You should at least try some different approaches to find a solution. And if you are still stuck after trying other methods, it's always acceptable to ask for some hints. Interviewers know people are not perfect and people can forget things under pressure. Let me just give you a hint. You can try to think about the property of the regression and conditional probability. I think like, because beta for regression is, is just an expected value for y given x. So for this two-dimensional graph, it's pretty obvious that y given x with x plus y greater than 1, it just follows uniform distribution from 1 minus x to 1. And we just calculate the expected value for this conditional distribution. And it's pretty straightforward that the coefficient is negative one over two. So yeah, I think this is a better way to solve this problem. Okay, let us go to the last stage of this interview, which is a coding test. So look at the screen. Based on the description, I need you to come up with an algorithm that is able to return a number of different expressions, including plus and minus sign, that you can lead to the target sum. Yeah, so I think um, I'll just try to use the depth of search algorithm to solve this problem and use a decision tree structure to like for each node, there are like two values for the first element is the index, the second element is the sum of the values following that path. And for each node, if I go right, it's like minus, minus sign and the left side is like plus sign and just like keep growing the tree. And eventually we can get like one of the combination from the leaf of the tree structure. And now I finish my um, visualization. I think I can start to code. So I think they're like the problem for my code efficiency. So you cannot pass when you try to run for all cases due to the time limit issue. What do you think your current time complexity and how can you make your code more efficient to pass all cases? In a coding test, understanding the time complexity is crucial because it helps evaluate the efficiency of different algorithms and data structures. 
People should try to learn different methods while preparing for the coding interview. The most optimal solution is not always necessary, but I don't recommend always using brute force, although sometimes it is acceptable. Especially interviewers often expect candidates to be able to write clean and efficient code. The time complexity right now is 2 to the power of n, n is the length of the array. And for this kind of like tree structure, the code efficiency will be really bad eventually if n grows pretty large. Because I have already saved all the results in my hash table. And if I use caching, time complexity, let's say t is the unique value of the sum value for the array. Then the time complexity will be n times t and the code will be changed to this Yeah, I think using caching make the code works pretty efficient right now. So this is the basic structure of a con research interview and I just want to make my video short and not too boring to the audience. That's the reason why I only pick some of the most basic questions during the whole video. But in reality, the problem should always be more difficult and more complicated, and you need to pass all these puzzles over 10 rounds. I still hope this video is helpful for anyone who wants to pursue quant as a career path. And not only for quant, this technical interview should also be helpful for anyone who wants to pursue software engineer or other scientific positions. If you have any question or advice, please just leave a comment, and I'm pretty happy to answer any of it. So thanks for watching. Thank you.